meeting. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Awesome, and then we've got all of our technical stuff in line for Tara, that's great. Okay, so I'm just gonna turn it over to our moderator, Anna Carson, for a couple of minutes, and then I'm gonna introduce our panelists tonight. Thank you so much. So uh, my name is Anna, and I'm just held up here to help um, sort of with the structure and the process of the town hall meeting. So if you want to go ahead and um, ask any questions to our presenters, um, you can utilize the chat feature and I will ask them, um, or you can also raise your hand and we'll be sure to give you space to connect with the presenters. Um, as always, this is just meant to be a safe, constructive and respectful space. So we ask everyone to always bring that best uh, foot forward. So thank you so much. And I think that's it for me, Jill. Okay, thanks. So this evening we have our, um, the district ranger for the Trinity River Management Unit. She is Tara Jones and she is new to us. So I asked her for a little bit of a bio and I'm gonna read that for you now. Tara grew up in Bernie, California where she was raised by a single mother. She participated in many sports, including basketball, softball, volleyball, and track. These endeavors brought her to Weaverville and Hayfork regularly. She coached high school basketball for over 20 years in Bernie. Tara began her forest service career while attending Lassen College. Her first job was on a fire engine. She met her husband at the Bogard Ranger Station on Highway 44. They have raised five children ranging in age now from 16 to 31. Tara's husband is a retired forest service fire engine captain and a current Cal Fire captain on the Humboldt Del Norte unit. Tara has been with the Forest Service for over 33 years. In that time, she has worked in fire, fire prevention, timber sale preparation, business administration, resources, and timber sale administration. She worked as a timber sale contracting officer for the Shasta Trinity, Mendocino, Klamath, and Six Rivers National Forest prior to becoming the district ranger on the Trinity River Management Unit. In her free time, she loves spending time with her family. She also enjoys reading, writing, and golf. Tara is looking forward to getting to know the west side of the Shasta Trinity and to being a part of the community that she has so frequently visited and admired. So just quickly, before I turn it over to Tara, when she gets finished with her presentation, she's gonna open it up for questions and Tara's the lead on the August cleanup. But if we have some questions that she wants um, some participation with, we also have with us this evening, Chris Losey. And he is the district ranger for the South Fork Management Unit, which includes um, the Hay Fork. And I don't know if I'm gonna say this right. Do I say Yolabola districts? So if I'm saying that wrong, somebody fix me. Um, so just a quick intro on Chris. He's been with the Forest Service for 12 years, including a year and a half as the assistant silviculturist in Platina and six years as the environmental coordinator in Reading. He has degrees in both forestry and law and was practicing attorney for the state of Arizona. Chris is originally from New Jersey and currently lives in Weaverville with his family. So when we get to that point, you'll feel like you know Chris a little bit. So I'm gonna turn it over now. Tara, thank you so much for your time and join, joining us and um, just hope you're, you're feeling well. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, it's really a, an, an honor and a privilege to be here with you tonight. Um, I apologize, I'm a little new to Zoom, and on top of that, I have a new computer, so that's why I had the audio issues right at the beginning, but I'm going to make sure I can share this PowerPoint with you. Um, should be this one. Let's see if I can do that. <clears throat> uh, oh, I think I just did it. Yeah. Hey, my friendly moderator. How do I go about sharing this uh, PowerPoint presentation? Absolutely. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, Tara, you should see a little green arrow that says share screen. So when you pop that open, you're going to see a box in your screen that will have different windows. So if you already have that PowerPoint pulled up in one of those windows, you'll be able to see it and click right on it and it will share it immediately. I do find, Tara, that it helps me if I already have it pulled up before I try to share my screen. Yeah, I, I had it up. I had it minimized on the screen, so I, I apologize. Um, I should be able to get it in there now. Window. Ah, okay. I got you now. All right. 
So I'm just going to start this from the beginning. I'm have a PowerPoint presentation at the beginning. Um, it should go fairly quickly, and uh, and then we'll get started with some questions and, and kind of walk you through what we're doing and what I'm thinking and, and how much I'm looking forward to this. So, all right. Um, so as Jill mentioned, um, my past is I grew up in Bernie, um, which is very similar to Weaverville. It's a small little uh, timber town uh, to the east um, and one that is trying to embrace a, a, a background that's more um, or a future that's got a, a bigger uh, recreation component to it. I have worked for the Forest Service for over 30 years. And as Jill said, those are the areas that I have worked in. Um, and I want to just say, and now is a good time to say this, I'm honored to work for the taxpayers and to help manage national forest lands on your behalf. And I will tell you that uh, there is no such thing as Forest Service land. Um, there is only national forest lands managed by the Forest Service, but the land belongs to all of you. Um, we, we just manage it on your behalf. Um, so that was the past. The present is the Forest Service has um, seen a considerable downturn in our non-fire employees in the last several years. Our, our fire employees have been on the rise. We have more engines um, and, and yet more engines, more helicopters, more hand crews. But um, with the way that the fire seasons are going, I don't know if we can ever have enough. Uh, the west side of Shasta, uh, the Shasta Training National Forest is comprised of the TRMU and the South Fork Management Unit. What was once the Big Bar and Weaverville Ranger Districts have become the Trinity River Management Unit. And between the South Fork Management Unit and the TRMU, there's only one planning team. So, so Chris, Losey, and I share a planning team for all of the work that gets done on the west side. And also fire seasons have become um, fire years. We used to talk about fire seasons, but as you know, uh, the August fire wasn't declared contained, I don't think, until November uh, 19th. So large fires have become mega fires. The August complex, as you know, um, was on the Mendocino, the Six Rivers and the Shasta Trinity, and it burned over a million acres. <clears throat> um, so the future, what, do, what, do I, what am I kind of seeing for the future? We need to move from being reactionary um, in a fire suppression model to, to being proactive with healthy forests, prescribed fire. Um, we will need to find new ways to work through shared stewardship to increase our pace and scale of treatments on the landscape. And the fact of the matter is, as I said, our, we don't have as many people as we used to. So we simply cannot do it alone. We'll be working with partners and stakeholders to utilize new opportunities to share the stewardship of national forest lands. Um, the local communities and their representatives will have a voice as we find treatments and improve forest resiliency, watersheds, and protect our communities. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about the August phase one restoration project um, that we're currently working on, um, on the Shasta Trinity. It is the number one priority for the Shasta Trinity uh, National Forest. It is on the South Fork Management Unit um, in the Forest Glen area. Um, so as you see, this is the, uh, this is the map showing the uh, ravage data. So ravage is, is kind of the burn intensity, fire intensity. And as you see down here, the uh, 75% mortality um, is the red area. And um, the green uh, obviously is 0% mortality. So if you look, you can see in the, um, at the upper edge of these shapes, you can see the treatments that are identified in phase one. And they're strategically laid out um, at the edge of the fire footprint of the August complex. Um, to That way we can create a, a fuel break that can keep fire from coming out of the old August fire footprint and also protect the community of uh, Forest Glen and uh, keep fire from going back into, um, back into this fire footprint where we did have some of this lower severity. So it's just a matter of being strategic with the, with the fire footprint that we have on the ground there. Um, and you'll notice there's a lot of ground there that we, that we just don't have something planned on, um, at least not yet. So purpose and need of the August phase one fire restoration is to improve public safety. Um, we know that uh, our communities like to be out on the forest. Um, we know it's critically important that we get our um, campgrounds up to, uh, up, to our, up to standards and get them uh, being used again because we know that that revenue is important to Trinity County. We also know that we need to get the, uh, the roads and um, Oh, gosh, the roads and the forest in, in just in better, better shape because we know that uh, in addition to campers, uh, that the local communities utilize the forest each and every day. So that's important. We also want to reduce the critical fuel loading so our communities can be safer moving into the future. 
So um, this is a shot of the uh, uh, Forest Glen campground. Um, and you can see how hot the fire burned through there. And so this is a good shot to show you that we want to improve public safety. <clears throat> Purpose and need, we want to expedite restoration in areas that experienced high effects of fire severity. And I know it's no fun to have a presentation where somebody reads you all the slides. So I won't be reading you every um, bullet point on these slides. Uh, it's just kind of a pet peeve with me. I, I just think, geez, I could read it myself. Um, but reforestation and de developing, getting the habitat back on the right track more quickly um, is important. It, you know, we have, we have hundreds of thousands of burned acres. And, and in this footprint, for strategic reasons, that um, we, we want to get this one kind of jump started. Uh, so as you see in this picture, I mean, we have, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of acres like this on the Shasta Trinity, not only from the August um, fire, but also uh, from the car fire, the Delta fire, the HERS fire. Um, we have experienced a lot of fire um, in the last three years. And so simply doing nothing or only doing roadside didn't seem like um, the way to go. It seemed like it was important this time to actually get some trees back in the ground. So for recreation, we wanna take care of the site rehabilitation, roadside um, reforestation. We wanna get some trees back in the ground um, and maybe some saplings. We wanna to try to get some trees uh, that will actually provide shade a little quicker. Um, we want to uh, deal with the roadside hazard trees that we talked about. And for reforestation, heavy site preparation is where the big trees are that we can't just uh, bulldoze over. So that will have a commercial salvage uh, component to it. And then the light cell preparation are these smaller plantations that we can pretty much just site prep it with a cat a pilot and then uh, get some trees back in the ground. Here's a foot, uh, picture of the, fire, of the project footprint and you can see it, the shape of it, um, that it, it sits right up against where the burn stopped. And, um, and here you see the, the forest glen piece as well as uh, the treatments we did along Highway 36. So these, these are the areas that we're analyzing. Um, here's the, the piece on the, for the proposed uh, or purpose and need. We talked about roadside hazard trees. We want um, you, our publics, to be able to come out and, and um, access the national forest and be safe with your families coming out to do that. Um, so we're going to not only get the trees that are currently dead, but we're gonna use a probability of mortality that says if that tree is, that 0.7 represents 70%, if that's 70% likely to be, um, to die in the next year, we will go ahead and remove it. I will tell you that the, if you looked on the picture, you saw that most of our treatments are in the high severity areas. This is a really good picture. There's no, there's no green there. Um, we expect to, to uh, not use a probability of mortality very often uh, because there's not, there's just not a lot of green trees in the areas that we're treating. Um, so we wanna plant conifers and culture hardwoods. So if you've been to the Forest Glen campground, uh, sorry, the uh, Scott Flat campground, you'll notice there's a pretty big uh, oak component out there. And we want to encourage those hardwoods to come back and, uh, and do an oak enhancement by uh, cutting those uh, conifers and, and letting the oak just kind of uh, take over because that's, that's the way that it was historically in there. Here's a picture of what the, the heavy site preparation would look like. You can see there's no way you're just gonna run a cat up there. You can also, um, based on the size of the trees, you can see that it's some good growing site. Um, and so if we put some more trees back in the ground there, they have a good chance to be successful and, um, and to get a, a jump start on that uh, habitat that we're trying to grow. So here's the recreation sites. Um, this one is Hell's Gate. Oh, sorry, Forest Glen. Proposed activities, remove the hazard trees, replace the parking and road barriers, remove debris from parking, uh, harden surfaces with gravel, place, uh, replace damaged tables, fire rings, fare boxes, um, you can, and replace all the signs. And then we wanna fix the roads. Uh, and where we can, we wanna uh, rock the roads. So, um, because that, that's going to keep that dust and that sediment out of the, out of the river as well. Um, here's what we had planned for the uh, Hellgate campground. Most of the, many of the trees that um, you see a lot of stumps here, those are trees that were a hazard to Highway 36, and those were removed by Caltrans or in their easement, and um, those trees were um, felt to be a hazard to the public. We uh, worked with Caltrans to get those trees um, harvested, 
uh, so that we could get the highway opened up again and so it was safe for the Caltrans workers to do some uh, guardrail and barrier work. Um, the Scott Flat Campground, um, we're looking to do uh, this list of work here. We want to remove the hazard trees. We want to lay out some more campgrounds and improve it. Um, we want to make sure that we keep people out of the meadow that's down there. Um, we want to replace the tables, fill in the burnt stump holes. Um, we want to have a, a, a kiosk where you enter so um, we can kind of explain what we did there and how we did it um, and, and where that, uh, and you can see all the oak out there I was, I was talking about and how the uh, conifers have encroached on that stand. Um, following August phase one, it will be August restoration phase two. So the focus on that will be uh, fire resiliency. So it will um, complement August phase one, but it is a standalone project. Um, they'll develop fire management zones, um, address critical fuel loading. Um, they will also address hazard trees on the uh, roads that are not in our in phase one's project area. They'll focus on road repair and maintenance. Um, they'll take uh, They'll put reforestation in and plantations that um, were existing. And um, probably the big thing is they'll allow for prescribed fire through, through maintenance burns. So for us to, we have a good fuel break um, on the landscape where the fire was burned at like low and to moderate intensity. And the plan is to build on that and, and maintain um, that, that burn so that we can keep a, a fuel break in there. <clears throat> okay, so what have we been doing? Um, you know, we've been kind of in COVID lockdown. Um, so I want to tell you some of the things we've been doing on the TRMU. Uh, the Weaverville Community Forest Phase 1 was signed. Um, we reintroduced prescribed fire into three units in the Weaverville Community Forest. That was approximately 80 acres. Um, we did uh, some mountain bike trail improvements uh, in partnership with the community. The community was uh, definitely the driving force and, a, and such a wonderful partner to get some really good work done. We worked with the community to find merchants who are willing to sell National Forest Christmas tree permits. So as you know, at Christmas time, all of our offices were closed. Uh, the only option we were really um, had was to do online Christmas tree sales. And we realized that, that not everyone in, um, in Trinity County has a uh, has internet and that the internet isn't always great in Trinity County. So we worked with a couple of merchants uh, or with a merchant and with the visitor center and they were able to sell uh, Christmas tree permits in person with all the proper COVID mitigation. So that was a huge win, um, something I really appreciated uh, the community stepping in and, and helping us meet the, the customer service needs of the community. So that, that was, I was just thrilled with that. Um, the Shastri National Forest is supporting the planning process for August phase one and phase two. They're the two highest uh, priorities for the forest. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have support from uh, districts as, you know, as far away as Mount Shasta McLeod. Um, we're borrowing their botanist um, and the Shasta Lake District is loaning us an archaeologist, um, a wildlife biologist, a forester. So it's, it's nice to have that much support. We're also working on um, some small uh, NEPA projects. And here's an example is uh, working on a, a fields reduction planning effort on the Guy Covington Drive um, in Highway 3. We want to uh, address brush and trees up to eight inches. They're going to be thin and chipped on site. So it's about 20 acres, but it still takes some effort on the planning side. We've got to do arc surveys out there and botany surveys and, and get, uh, get a decision that we can move forward and, and, and get that done. We're working with the um, RCD on that, I believe. Um, and I believe that area was also identified, I could be wrong, but by the, um, oh, the Fire Safe Council. Um, you may have heard about the Great American Outdoors Act. So the Great American Outdoors Act was signed, um, I think in like late uh, during the last administration um, at the end of 20. Um, so that's, that's been a great, it was a bipartisan um, uh, act and it, it brings additional funding to really address some of our critical needs in uh, recreation. And some of our facilities are just are run down and there was no way to get the money to, to fix them up. So uh, as you can see, several projects were selected for funding this fiscal year on the TRMU. The projects will be completed um, using agreements uh, with the California Conservation Corps, the Eastern Sierra Conservation Corps, the, the Watershed Research and Training Center out of Hayport, as well as under several contracts and by Forest Service employees. Um, so this is, this is really important. The TRMU uh, Recreation Officer is going to be working with community representatives and partners to identify priorities for recreation deferred maintenance needs 
under the Great American uh, Outdoors Act for future project requests. So when we when we submit our proposals and we want to compete in the region uh, to get our um, our projects funded, we we want to hear from the community which which projects you think are the number one priority. So um, that's that's going to be uh, super super uh, important that we hear from you on that. And, so what else are we doing in recreation? We're working with partners um, and local community members to construct and maintain the trails within the uh, typo. Then the Weaverville Community Forest Partners and Volunteers constructed the multi-user router cabin and bike designate uh, design blue lead sections of the WCF Fuels and Recreation Project this spring. I did see some really cool video of some folks riding that section of road and uh, wow, um, that, that's definitely on my bucket list of things to do. Uh, trail rehabilitation work is planned utilizing an agreement with the Student Conservation Association of the Trinity Alps Wilderness to address impacts from the salmon fire. Um, and then I really want to highlight, uh, you know, like everyone else, uh, the COVID situation and the national health pandemic really brought us some challenges. Um, people flocked to the national forests and um, they, you know, wanted to get out and, and uh, hike the trails and, and be outside because it was one of the only things we could do. Well, we saw uh, just more use than we had ever seen before, uh, astronomical compared to what we had had in the past. So I was very proud of the recreation staff who um, kept rose to the challenge and kept the facilities clean and open. And uh, gosh, just kind of er, the rules changed every other day, I think, and they just did an outstanding job of, of meeting the needs of our, um, of our public. So um, front office services, many of you must be wondering when the front office is going to open. So they've remained closed under regional and national direction. What permits and requests for services have been addressed remotely. Generally people call, give us the information they need, um, and then um, the front desk staff finds a way to either mail them what they need or, or meet their uh, customer service needs remotely. Um, the good news, the front office is scheduled to reopen on May 24th and we'll have regular business hours um, most business transactions and questions will occur on the front porch. Um, customers in the front office will be limited to one or two with a mask and following social distance requirements. So even though uh, Trinity County has um, a certain set of rules and the state of California has a certain set of rules, as, as you can uh, probably guess that the uh, Forest Service, we have national direction. So we thought that by moving the, um, the customer service piece out to the porch, um, we could make it as easy as possible for, um, for our customers. And then if somebody really needed to come in to, to look at a book or wanted to buy a map, um, then that, that's a, an option as well. All right, what next? Healthy forests and protected communities. Uh, but obviously that's, that's kind of what we are all about, right? Is healthy forests and protecting our communities. I will tell you, um, my husband and my uh, daughter were on the campfire. And um, that really, uh, you know, watching what happened to the town of Paradise um, and knowing, you know, some of the fires that have been on the edge of Weaverville um, and the fire history you have, it, protecting the communities is, is vitally important. Um, so we need, to, we need to look at fuels reduction. We need to look at ingress and egress. So I, I'd like to meet with the, um, with the sheriff's department and, and find out what, what is our evacuation plan for Weaverville and and have we treated the, uh, the highways along the highway so that if we had to get out of town, um, we could do that safely. You know, during the Delta fire um, on, on Interstate 5, there were logging trucks catching on fire. Um, and I just, you know, as curvy as all of the roads are out of Weaverville, I want to make sure that we've, that we've addressed that and that we've given everyone the best chance to, to get out of town if that's what we need to do. So I want to work with the Sheriff's Department and the, uh, the OES community to make sure that I know what we're doing with the um, evacuation plan and that um, we've managed the forest to, to facilitate and support that plan. Um, working with the community and partners in the shared stewardship approach to forest management. So um, as soon as we can get around the corner on COVID, I'd like to have um, open house meetings um, twice a year, one in the spring, one in the fall to, to let you know what we've been doing on your behalf and to hear what, you, what you'd like us to do uh, I want to develop projects collaboratively. I want to provide opportunities just to listen to what, what you have to say. So that where do you fit in? Uh, we, you know, you have an opportunity to participate in the planning process. So how, how do you participate? Well, you can attend meetings. Um, if we have field trips, you can go to those. If we have those open houses, you can go to those. Um, provide comments during scoping. As you know, in the um, classifieds, there's a, a 
there's a section where they have uh, official notices. And um, our paper of record, however, is a record searchlight because it comes out daily. And that's uh, one of the conditions for a paper of record. Um, so if you wanted to get added to our mailing list, um, you can contact our district office and I will make sure that you get added to the, um, to the mailing list. Or, and by contract with, this, contract with the district office, you can email me, I'll, I'll give you my email and we'll make sure that you get on there. There's also, if you want to go look for yourself, this link, um, you pretty much just search for uh, Shasta Trinity National Forest and then um, you go into resources and projects and you can find all of the NEPA documents that we're working on at that website. Um, so here's another example. You can review the draft EA documents. And you know, an EA is an environmental assessment and provide comments. So the August fire restoration phase one draft EA um, will be coming out soon, probably the, um, the first of, uh, around the first of June. Um, look at it, see, if, see what you think and provide comments. Uh, there's, there's certainly an opportunity and I encourage you to do so. Um, attend post-treatment field trips. We will be starting logging again on um, Brown's phase three. Uh, that's scheduled to start up um, on or around June 1st. You can also reach out informally and share your knowledge about Trinity County and the community of Weaverville. I'm, I've, I think I've been down to the visitor center uh, three or four times. It's a nice little walk and uh, I enjoy getting down there and hearing about the history of the community. Um, which I have always, always admired, and there's nothing better than driving through Weaverville um, during the holidays. So, um, some more on the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, you can help us identify out your priorities for recreational infrastructure improvements. Um, we are going to work through, uh, work with our partners through agreements. As I said, the recreation officer has been very successful in managing agreements. It currently has 15 different agreements. Whew, I know this is a lot. You guys are doing great. Uh, so mastered stewardship agreements, when you, when you, you might hear the agency and I know during your last, uh, we had a board of supervisors meeting where, um, our regional forester talked about, uh, shared stewardship. So this is one of those tools. Um, a master stewardship agreement is the ability to bundle several contracts into one and to treat at a larger landscape scale. Um, it requires upfront collaboration with the government. So federal, state, local, tribal governments, the local communities, non-government organizations, and interest groups. So um, we have an MSA with the uh, RCD in the Weaverville Community Forest. That, that's an example of where we have one. Um, there are organizations issued completing restoration treatments through an agreement, that's NFWF. And it's the 2018 omnibus bill allows for 20 year agreements. And one of the good things about this is it creates additional jobs in rural communities. and um, you know, we're, we're starting to turn that corner. We figure out that we can't, we can't do everything on our own. And um, our partners have really kind of stepped into that gap for us to help us get some things done. Contract agreement opportunities. So we have traditional timber sale contracts, um, integrated resource contracts. Those are stewardship contracts. You can have um, a service contract and you can have a integrated um, resource timber contract. So the good thing about a timber contract is it generally generates retained receipts that can then be um, spent in agreements right back out in Trinity County. So that, that's important. We recently got um, all of the west side of the Shasta Trinity National Forest has been declared a stewardship area. So that door is open for us to, to be able to do some of that shared stewardship work in, in Trinity County. Um, and the Good Neighbor Authority. So the Good Neighbor Authority is um, I'll show you, actually, another slide that will show that. Here you go. So this is the agreement structure. So you have a standalone agreement. Some of the agreements that Sally manages are just standalone agreements, like with the CCCs or the, um, the backcountry folks, uh, some of the other people that Sally works with, that's off, often, um, or with the watershed center, those are often standalone agreements. You can have a master agreement um, and, a sup and supplemental agreements. So you have a master agreement that says, we'll do things in the, w in the Weaverville Community Forest. Here's a supplemental project agreement that, um, that we can go have the RCD do. Um, or you can have a master agreement that's on a larger scale. I would tell you that uh, Siskiyou County has um, an agreement with uh, the Klamath and Shasta Trinity National Forest that's uh, 500,000 acres. So obviously you can have a number of um, supplemental project agreements and modifications. 
the good thing about them is, is there, you can continue to, to modify them. Um, in closing, so in closing, uh, I'm excited to let you know that the Trinity County Resource Advisory Board, also known as the RAC, will be active again. This is a great opportunity to get work done on the ground. We are thrilled and excited to be part of this community. Um, we have, I will tell you, we have not done a great job of letting you know what we've been working on or in soliciting your feedback and your input. Um, it's clear, I, I will tell you, it is clear and I've been so impressed with how passionate the community of Weaverville is about their national forest. I'm so impressed with the number of committees and groups dedicated to addressing fuels, recreation, healthy forests, water quality, fish habitat. Clearly the ties to the natural resources run deep here. Um, I, there are a lot of people that volunteer a lot of their time um, because the forest is so important to them and the natural resources are so important to them. And I, I just want to say I'm looking forward to embracing the shared stewardship uh, to put those deep ties in your local knowledge into action. So that is the end of my PowerPoint. Thank you for bearing with me. I know um, that's a lot. Sarah, and... thank you for that. And thanks for taking all the time to make the PowerPoint. I know for me that visual is really, really helpful as you're speaking. Um, so thank you. I also just want to say at this juncture, I love your positivity. And I also love how you are so desiring to interact with the community. Um, every time I've said to Tara, hey, do you have time for a cup of coffee? The answer is always yes. When, when can we make that happen? And um, to me, that's impressive, that willingness to talk and work and partner together and just even communicate is, is so appreciated. Um, thank you for that. So let's move to some questions. Um, you can raise a hand or stick it in the chat, however you would prefer, and Anna will um, take care of that. Great, so we had one um, to start in the chat, Tara. Um, I believe it had to do around the phase one, um, kind of that campground reopening. Um, has that funding been secured? When do you think that funding will um, come through? And also, when can we expect to see some of those campgrounds that you mentioned, like Forest Glen, um, Hell's Gate, and Scott Flat uh, be reopened to the public? Well, the first thing we have to do is address the, the hazard trees that are in there, right? The, the last thing we want, um, is to have any problems with uh, uh, with the public safety in there. So the first thing we're gonna do is um, we're gonna get August phase one signed in, uh, we're gonna sign at the end of July, and then um, we'll make those campgrounds a priority units to harvest so that with the hope that we can start to get the beginning those squared away by the fall. I know Sally has some, uh, some restrooms and things she's gotta get fixed in there. Um, so the goal is for us to be in and out of there by the fall. And then of course, some of the restoration work um, with uh, you know, getting the saplings planted and, and getting the road rocked and some of that might, might bleed over into the, the spring, but uh, that's the plan is those will be the priority units. I'm hoping for the fall, but um, I'm generally an optimistic person. So um, hopefully in the fall, but uh, I know at, at a minimum, we should be ready to go by uh, spring. Thank you. Kathleen, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, mine is more, I guess, of a comment than a question. Um, so just wanted to say hello. My name is Kathleen McCulley. I'm currently the um, Grizzly Corps member, um, which is a new AmeriCorps program at the RCD. And I primarily have been working on the, you know, within projects for the Weaverville Community Forest. Um, the largest of which is drafting the strategic plan update for the WCF. Um, so, and I just kind of wanted to advocate, like I, I feel like it, at least for kind of the Weaverville area, um, I think of, we're like trying to do a lot of this type of kind of community engagement and like getting community members to participate on projects and things um, already. And I think we, we at least have the foundation set up, um, can definitely be improved and grow. But um, I would just advocate like to really take advantage of the Community Forest Steering Committee. And um, I, th I think kind of as the RCD continues to have Grizzly Corps fellows, um, they, for the foreseeable future, will kind of be the WCF spokespeople. Um, so just, yeah, continuing to collaborate with the RCD and Grizzly Corps closely um, and trying to 
utilize some of those things that we do already have in place. Um, like for example, one, one thing that really came to my mind was when you mentioned um, doing uh, buying or two, two kind of community meetings a year. Um, and at the moment we do at, at least an annual and we're trying to increase the number of um, specifically WCF like community meetings on project updates and things. Um, so I, I wasn't sure if, if you were talking about more specifically kind of for the Weaverville area or the whole Shasta T, but um, I think that's that's like would be a good opportunity to, to take advantage of for this more local area. Right, and I uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that feedback. Um, I did have a, a nice long uh, chat with Kelly um, and plan to have regular meetings with him. Um, I, you know, and I'll tell you what I told him was I feel like uh, the, the RCD is like a, a cleanup hitter and we're, we're not utilizing them to their full potential. Um, so it's important to that we engage with you guys and really maximize what, what I think we need to increase what you guys can, can help us get done on the National Forest. And, and you take such a critical role in that WCF that, and it's such an important, um, such an important collaboration that, that I think we can use that and, and really use it, utilize it more than what we currently are. And, and thank you very much for the, I am trying desperately hard to get through the August phase one uh, restoration planning efforts so that I can get back on the Weaverville side and, and really be focused on that. But I, I sure appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much. Yeah, we definitely understand you all are busy. <laughs> Um, and I'll just throw out there too for everyone else on the call um, that the strategic plan for the Weaverville Community Forum, specifically in this area or you know near Douglas, needs to the public on Friday will be kind of a two-week community review period. So um, some of the stuff that Tara has been talking about, getting the community directly involved. Um, is just around the corner and we're having some community meetings to discuss the strategic plan specifically on the 20th and the 25th. Um, so hope to see some of you there as well. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, Paul, we'll go to you in just a second. There was a question here in the chat um, about um, an existing fire impact here at the Helena fire. I don't know if you're willing and able to address that question, Tara. It has, the question is, what are the USFS plans for reducing the fuel loads in the Helena fire footprint and especially the roadside residential community buffers and ridge tops? Um, I, gosh, I really appreciate that question. Um, I don't, I don't know. We've made it that far. We do have a, a plan to address the flat fire, um, and uh, we'll be doing some third-party NEPA through an agreement for that to look at uh, some multiple work that we can do. Uh, the uh, what is it? The Great Basin Institute is going to help us with some third-party NEPA, kind of figuring out what we want to do there. So um, I, I'm taking notes. So the Helena fire footprint and um, the uh, Roadside hazards and critical fuel loading. And ridge tops. Uh, near ridge tops, okay. And while okay. you're wildly writing, Tara, we can also get your copy of the chat so you don't have to take notes. Okay, that'll be, uh, yeah, that'll be super helpful. Because you, you know that I, I'm a wild writer, so. Okay, Paul, do you want to go ahead and go next? And then we have a few other questions in the chat when Paul is finished. Sure, and I might mention on that Helena fire, Tara, you know, it started on BLM ground. I'm not sure exactly what area they're talking about, but a great deal of that is BLM, which means it might not be on your priority list. But <clears throat> um, one, I wanted to uh, thank you for the, I know it seems small, but I bought my Christmas tree permit from up north. And it worked fantastically. I would say it will continue to work fantastic even when COVID is over, if you want to keep doing that. Uh, it, it sure would be popular. Um, the question, I, I'm going to squeeze two questions into one. You mentioned reforestation um, and you mentioned plantations. Is any of this going to be reforested with the idea that uh, one day you'll harvest timber? And if so, you know, how many acres or approximately how much? And then do you expect to be litigated on this project? Do we expect to be litigated? Uh, you know, um, we did get a lot of comments during um, scoping. So, um, but, I, but I think it's, a, you know, we strategically stayed in uh, the high severity areas. We, we 
uh, had a focus of restoration. And so, you know, I can never really, my crystal ball is not that good. Generally, sometimes I think that people push back on projects that have a lot of really good things going for them and, and maybe they just see things a little differently. Um, with regards to the reforestation, that's a really good point. So we're trying to turn the corner with the agency, right? If, if, if we turn, if we burn up a plantation, we want to be strategic in where we plant and how we plant. In the past, we used to plant trees right back out to the edge of the road again. And it's like, well, that, that just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, that now your road's not even a decent fuel break. So we're planning to do some uh, cluster planting. We're planning on pushing the, the trees back away from the road. But, you know, some of the ground that burnt is matrix ground, what we call matrix ground. And then according to our land management plan, um, that, that ground is um, one of the things we do there is we have timber harvest to help support rural communities. So um, that, that's one of the things that will likely happen. Uh, we just want to be careful when we put the trees in that we don't uh, create the very problem we're trying to uh, solve. Thank you so much. Um, the question next in the chat in the queue here is about the stewardship agreements. Um, and it's kind of how is that process work? So is that a process that's instigated by you, by the Forest Service, or do community groups come and advocate to be stewardship partners? Um, and, and kind of what is required for that process and what are some of the timelines to, to get involved in, in a project such as a stewardship, a shared stewardship project? Right. So um, generally, like uh, some of the people we typically would have, um, I'll just tell you who we've had agreements with. How's that? We've had agreements with uh, like the Caldeer is a is a partner we've had um, master stewardship agreements with um, the Wild Turkey Federation, um, the Mule Deer Foundation, um, Rocky Mountain Elk. Um, so on the on the uh, Shasta Cloud Management Unit, they have a big agreement. They're working with uh, Caldeer right now to do some of the uh, the timber cell preparation um, at laying out units. Uh, they're, they're doing a lot of that work to help that unit treat a lot of their acres. So, so that's kind of some of the typical, um, obviously we, we have agreements with the RCD um, and um, different agreements with, uh, with uh, the watershed center. So, and as I said, there was, and there was some interest by uh, the board of supervisors. They talked about uh, Trinity County may be interested in, in um, considering uh, uh, an MSA. And um, I, I would recommend reaching out to uh, Ray Haup, H-A-U-P-T. He's uh, on the Siskiyou County Board of Supervisors. Um, I've, I had the pleasure of working with him a little bit in my capacity um, as a contracting officer on the Klamath. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're gonna, we have a, about four or five more minutes for questions. There are still a few here in the chat. Um, you mentioned a decrease in non-fire personnel, and you also mentioned an increase in recreational use to, um, to, the, to the national forest lands. So the question here essentially is, um, do any of those increase in recreational users somehow leverage more dollars to be brought in to have non-fire personnel staff or for recreational staffing? Is, is there a connection there? Um, I know we're, we're looking at that. We're, we're really looking at, um, at, at how to be more strategic in, in how we address our recreation needs. Um, there's not, historically, there's not been a great um, correlation between the amount of people that use the National Forest and the funding available to uh, support that use. Uh, I know the agency and the forest in particular is, is looking at ways to, to kind of make that more right-sized. Um, we're also going through a new budget process. So we're trying to look at where we where we invest the people you know like do does it make more sense to have somebody in this position or in that position and so uh recreation is really a, a big ticket item in trinity county um and and it's really important to the people who live here it's important to your economy um and so uh we're we're trying to find ways to, to stem it up as you know sally cousins just does a remarkable job of managing that program um and working with partners uh to get a, just a, an incredible amount of work done um, the bike trails that we have on uh, on the west side are just incredible, and uh, we will do, be doing everything we can to streamline that special use permit process for bike races and things like that, so that you can get um, have more of those type of opportunities to bring more revenue into the counties. Do you know about how many um, personnel you have working on fuels reduction? So, um, kind of that proactive on on the fuels reduction side. How many staff are under the Forest Service that do fuels reduction? 
pretty much well everything we do is generally geared towards fuels reduction at this point um there's you know i think that i tried to kind of lay out the direction i wanted to go uh with with the district and so to answer the question as best i can all of our planning is about fuels reduction for the most part there might be a small little thing about a road decommissioning or something but in general most of our planning or or um like the, the Weaverville Community Forest was fuels reduction. Um, and we just got that signed. We still have phase two to get signed, to get some work done to get that signed. Um, August phase uh, one restoration is, is primarily about fuels reduction. Uh, but, but I think finding that right size and the right, the right treatment that, that can benefit wildlife, reduce fuels, um, you know, maybe improve our campgrounds. You know, I've talked with a few people about the potential to do something on highway three and really make sure that that corridor is safe for people trying to get out of town and then incorporate some of those campgrounds and address forest health in the campgrounds because on the Shasta Lake side, for instance, uh, most of the trees, many of the trees in their campgrounds that are that make those campgrounds so attractive are, are dying. And we have many, uh, we have some similar forest health issues in our campgrounds. Now it is difficult to treat just a campground, but if you make it part of a bigger project, um, it, those things kind of work out. Um, we could also, I, we talked about the flat fire restoration, it's, it, you know, many of our water sources aren't, um, uh, need some work, they need some rock, they need to be improved and for, for fire access, for whatever. So kind of finding that, that those treatment options that improve um, not just fuels, but also public safety, community, you know, safety, forest resilience. Um, and I, I don't think it's that hard. There's a lot of acres out there. We should be able to find the right ones. Um, thank you so much. I don't see any other questions in the chat. I actually do have one personal question myself. So if I, I pull this off, um, I was a product of the, the CCC, the California Conservation Corps. I'm wondering if there's any discussion or capacity to develop like a, a youth crew core here under, under the Forest Service um, because we have so much land and we have all of these young folks that need skills and, and, and employment opportunities. Um, do you think there's uh, a pathway for that here in the Shasta T. That 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 is a wonderful question. I can't thank you enough for asking it. Um, I think having a having a YCC crew out of Weaverville. Uh, Jill and I talked about that. I think the first time we met. Um, I I look at the fact that we try to hire temporary employees, and I can't. I don't have any housing for them. And I always think, well, why aren't we why aren't we hiring our local high school kids? I mean, that's that's how I got started. Um, so I, I just don't, that's, you're exactly right. A YCC crew to, um, I know we've been trying to reach out to the forestry program there at the high school to make sure they're involved. Um, that, that I think is a really good way to uh, give people skills, to show people, you know, the things we're working on to, to develop job skills and, and to have um, some outreach for us, so filling some positions later on. And, and really that would help solve some of our, barracks uh, and housing issues that we, we always run into. Great question. Thank you so much. I know Jill's giving me eyeballs. I will just say I rode my bike down the new trail on Mother's Day, the blue lead. It was awesome. So uh, thanks so much for creating great recreational use for us locals. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Jill. Thanks, Tara. Thank you so much for your time and preparation and um, being here with us, answering questions and giving a great presentation. Also, just I'm grateful for your availability and all of the means by which you have outlined that people can take part in all of these processes and speak into um, the outcomes they hope to see. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to make sure that we reserved a few minutes this evening to just open up comments generally on topics of concern to you, things that are going on, things that you see happening, wish could happen. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if you've come with those kind of thoughts in your mind already, but hopefully there's some, um, if you've had those things in your mind, now's a great opportunity. And um, I'll speak to the things that I can and take notes to find you answers on the things that I don't have. So feel free to stick something in the chat, raise your hand and Anna will help you out. Jill, I don't know how to raise a hand on a Zoom meeting, but I have, right. a question. I have a question for you. Hey, back when I did the town hall meeting, I think it might have been in February, um, you mentioned something about the project start, and I see it on your website also. 
about us getting a traffic signal at the four-way intersection. It said Rick Tippett said it was going to start on April 15th and be concluded by the end of May. And I, I'm coming as a fire chief and a concerned citizen of Weaverville. I see on the weekly almost head-on collisions. I see people blow through the four-way intersection without even realizing it's there. And it, it's quite a big safety concern for myself, my department, and the people we serve in Weaverville. So I was just kind of curious if you had any updates or if you could maybe find out kind of where the progress is on that. I know it's been in the making for many years and we're so close. I'm just kind of curious where we're at. Um, yes, thank you. And I kind of anticipated that that question might come from um, at least one person tonight um, because I was so specific on the website um, and and I was, I was carefully specific. I will tell you, I reached out for that specific, specific <laughs> to be that specific. And, um, and, and, I, and I did copy paste um, that information. So I didn't reword anything there. Um, I guess I'm a little bit confused myself as to how we could be that specific when we don't have an actual, um, date on the calendar, but the last update when all of that got changed um, was said that we are trying to get Caltrans and the contractor to settle on a date. So I will tell you that doesn't make sense to me. Um, the, the reason that I pushed for that initially is because I'm worried about risk management. And um, I have gone back and looked at some documents that show that all the way back to 2017, um, Caltrans has expressed their concern over, um, over the possibility of what could go on there and the liability that could be on the county. So um, I, I don't know what to do further about that and accept to receive those comments from you and have the public share the concern and, and to be vocal about that concern. And so, you know, we've been hearing about finishing this for four years. Um, and it, you know, I, I guess to have you express that so that this time for sure it happens. Um, if there's something further that um, you want to see me do, I would be happy to have you be that specific with me. Jill, can you hear me? I can. Hi, Scott. Oh, hi. I, and I apologize. I went straight from work to a special school board meeting here in Lewiston, and I came in partway through, and I don't know how to do this, so I apologize for that. You're you cool. don't want to see a picture of me because I'm very dirty right now. Um, Caltrans is on record multiple times to the county. This is a county project, as we, you know, you know, Caltrans is on the record that we stand first in terms of liability for this project. Caltrans has put that in writing to the Board of Supervisors. This project hasn't been just four years, it's been over 14 years. And I'm really concerned that the same long line of stories and misconstruisions and, and perhaps absolute falsehoods are being put out by the Director of Transportation. I've addressed the board I've been involved with this project a very, very long time, both as a county staff person and just as a citizen for over two decades. And I've heard the same stories multiple, multiple times, and I'm continuing to wait and understand. This is a, this is a county approved project that was not required by Caltrans. The county's approval, it's county approved with state and federal funds. We, I believe, are on the hook. If anybody looks into the record of this project, the county has not delivered something they said over 10 years ago. How we could not be anything but negligent in a lawsuit is beyond me. I think that our, there, I believe our fire chief for Weaverville is very correct. In the county, if we lose multiple, multiple, multiple million dollars of, that will be county, either road funds or general fund dollars that we don't have many of. It's appalling to me that county staff has taken something that is a priority to the board. It's in your regional transportation plan, your community plan, your environmental document, and has failed to deliver that. To me, that's negligence. And again, I believe that we would be liable if we were sued. And now we're hearing the same story, the same story again and again. This is the same story that the current director of transportation said five, six, seven years ago. It's the same story 
the same what I would call falsehoods. And I'm getting prepared to go public again and really call this to task. I am very, very concerned we're going down the same thing. So I, I really hope that the Board of Supervisors takes this seriously, and especially that we have a board member for the community that's willing to represent the county's interests rather than personal interests. And I applaud you for that and the job you're doing. If you can take that forward, I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, I was really encouraged when the original date came as April 15th through May 30th. Just really hopeful we weren't gonna go through a summer season. And particularly now with COVID ending and thinking that traffic would be at you know, its highest, um, hoping that we have a safe summer if that's not gonna be finished until September as last stated. So um, maybe by some miracle, we could have an earlier date on the calendar. Um, Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Anybody else? Paul. Yeah, Jill, this is Paul again. Um, so I, I've got an unrelated question, but after hearing Scott and Todd, I'd like to kind of reemphasize if the level of liability is what it sounds like, I would encourage you to pursue that. You know, at the PUD here, we face some massive legal actions and I can tell you it's not enjoyable. Uh, the county will not enjoy being in that situation. So anything you can do to rectify it. I know I've been involved in the traffic signal slash roundabout discussion for I don't know at least five or six years. I know it's been going on a long time. But the question I had relates and you know I, I mean it constructively to permitting. Um, you know, at the PUD, we hear from customers, you know, anybody building anything new, they, they want power. And we're hearing consistently from folks that are building both homes and uh, cannabis operations that permitting, the permitting cycle is incredibly long at the county. Um, you know, I understand that resources may be thin, but um, I didn't know if there's any hope for improvements in that in the future. And again, this is both from you know, residential uh, construction, a little bit of commercial construction, and and certainly uh, uh, cannabis farming act licensed cannabis operators that just takes forever to get permitting done and inspections completed. Absolutely, thank you for um, outlining that so clearly, and also the the resulting pressure that that puts on the PUD when you don't have um, a consistent. I would guess streamlined, maybe more predictable process so that you know what it is that you're going to need to respond to in order to provide for those people. Do I hear you correctly on that? that, that that's actually a great point. I know the general plan is probably going to take three or four years, but where there's, if there were some zoning process, uh, it would be much easier, you know, as an electric service provider to know where large loads are going on the system. You know, now it seems almost as if it's a random process in terms of where they occur. And I'll admit it's extremely challenging to manage from a PUD perspective because you just don't, you don't know where to make your investments ahead of time. It forces you to always be in a reactionary uh, state and kind of behind the curve as people are expecting service in a timely manner. Okay, so, so my question any, back to you was kind of both and the pre-planning and also the streamlined process to make it smoother, more efficient. Yeah, um, we'd love to see improvements in both, thanks. Okay, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Sorry, Jill, it's me, Scott, again. You're good. Uh, sorry, but that raises a good point about the environmental document and Darrow's shaking, I think he's shaking his head at me. The, um, but the environmental process and the general plan update, the one thing I, I, and I don't know how the county is gonna approach this, but the opt out areas were very, very hard fought for for the communities, my community of Lewiston, and they've been extremely effective in helping us. I say that both as a resident and as a school board member here in Lewiston, that the opt out areas should be part of what I would call the, the no project or the existing condition analysis, they are there. And so any impacts introduced from cannabis into those areas would all be brand new. And so they should be really strongly considered in however the county moves forward because I'd hate to have to start over again 
for the communities that have the opt-out areas and, and go back and try to defend and recreate the protections we have in our communities. I, I know uh, both as a school board member, I've seen the benefit. And it's also personally, the opt-out areas personally benefited me as a homeowner and having to deal with the grow that would have been very problematic anyway. So I just really encourage the county, however it can, can really strengthen or take into account or really make sure those opt-out areas are considered. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Anybody else? We're at 801. Um, I want to finish timely so that you um, continue to hold trust in the hour and not think that I'm going to hijack your time. Um, but if there's anything further, we'll just leave the meeting open here. As people log off, you can still throw it in the chat. It will be captured there. And of course, you can email or call. Um, so again, thank you, Tara, for being here and Chris for hopping on to be prepared for any questions that might come your way. Thank you all for your thoughtful comments. And I appreciate your concern for us, not only presently, but thinking of those liability issues and what could be ours to bear that would be um, far more easily avoided than dealt with. So um, thanks for being here tonight. Your presence shows you care and I appreciate that about each of you. All right, have a great evening. Um, and on, I just would say, make sure that you do whatever's needed to grab that chat before we um, end the meeting.